I am too seeking aesthetic wisdom. But like T.S. Eliot, I wonder, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? And where is the life we have lost in living? But I'm grateful to be here, seeking, questioning and learning. All learning is remembering, Socrates once said. Thus, the chief job of the teacher is to help us to remember all that we have forgotten. I am mostly concerned of the things that make life, living and even death, sacred and meaningful. The essential stuff. What is often left out of the curriculum, things that are often invisible to the eyes. In art, as Madeleine Langle suggests, either as creators or participants, we are helped to remember some of the glorious things we have forgotten and some of the terrible things we are asked to endure. My intention is to help you remember, to remember, recall your glorious things, your forgotten potentials, and to put meanings into motion. Look at your hands. Immanuel Kant said, the hand is the window on the mind. Look around and you may see in the surrounding objects how the work of our hands can inform the work of the mind. Perhaps it is not a far-fetched idea that our hands are intelligent. When I worked as an organic farmer, my boss often said that life begins in gardens and relies on gardens. And I still consider farming and gardening as a contemplative art, a caring, nurturing, humbling form of art, especially when one engages his or her hands. And the only shared variable among super centennials is the fact that they all tend gardens on a regular basis throughout their lives. As a young boy, I was helping my grandparents in their vineyard. As we weeded the hillside rows, my grandma shared all kinds of stories. One day when she told me a story about how Jesus turned water into wine, I burst out in a contemptuous laughter. Mama, I don't believe in miracles. Then she slowly walked to a nearby well and filled up a watering can. She looked into my eyes and said, the real miracle is that this happens all the time. I watched as she poured the water on the flowering plants and suddenly I understood that water will indeed turn into wine. Water will turn into leaves, flowers, swelling fruit, flesh and wine. It takes time, but it happens all the time. As a child, I dismissed the miracle story of Jesus. It was a fiction, a lie. But I also dismissed the truth that radical transformation is possible. For this, I had to learn to look at everything more carefully. I realized that what makes things valuable is the time I engage in contemplation, looking deeper and deeper into reality so I may see beyond my own ideas. But in our cult of speed and efficiency, I wonder if indeed we want to set aside time for contemplation. The poet suggests, take time to contemplate, to pray. It is the sweet oil that eases the hinge into the garden so the doorway can swing open easily. You can always go there. My grandmother would often say strange things like Voditash that I would rather emulate an earthworm than an astronaut. She understood that earthworms are just as vital as astronauts or college professors and I think she would have claimed that earthworms performed the same miracle as Jesus did with the water, making new life possible, making a harvest possible, making joy possible. Then I lost her. She died. This was the first time I turned to slow art making. I could identify with broken shards of glass. There was chaos, sharp edges and pain. But working with fragmented broken glass forced me to slow down, allowed me to use art making as a form of active remembering, active grieving, active loving. Day after day I sat for long hours, slowly piecing together broken glass, recalling memories, giving thanks for her life and for the time I shared with her. After spending over 10 days in a forced confinement, 
laying flat on my stomach without turning or lifting my head due to a retina surgery. I received a letter from Carolyn Ellis. If I would be interested in creating the cover art for their new book, Evocative Autoethnography. Her invitation became my recovery. I had to relearn or unlearn the ways my eyes and hands previously worked together, but slow making tamed my double distorted vision. It removed my rage over the loss of sight and my constant headaches. I discovered that slowing down is not a deficiency or a problem to overcome. It is my life. A gallery owner once looked at my portfolio and told me that I need to be more prolific. If I want to succeed, I need to make more. When I told him that I often work on a piece for months, he shook his head and said to me, that's not efficient enough. You must optimize your production. Indeed, we live in a world of efficiency, optimization, maximizing profits, and eliminating what is not essential. But what do we lose? What are the consequences of maximizing profit? When we gain something, who is going to lose or have less? So what's the value of slow making, slow scholarship, slow cooking, slow driving, slow epistemology? I was fortunate to meet Jerry Rowicki in Carolyn Ellis's Grief and Loss class. We read and discussed their story, The Clean Shirt. And I wanted to thank Jerry by making him something like replacing that lost shirt. I wanted to honor his story and his life. And this is an important dimension of art making in academia, to use and make art to honor stories, to honor lives. I hand carved hundreds of glass pieces. This process became a form of prayer, a thanksgiving. As I slowly carved the glass, I recited the names of places and individuals who perished during the Holocaust, including Jerry's family and relatives. This process became a sacred communion in which the process of making and my tools gained new significance. When I placed the cold glass elements into my kiln to melt it, I wept. I understood that ovens and extreme heat was also used to incinerate people, but now I was making an offering for someone who survived. Last year, here at ICQI, I discussed how Art Buckner's story, Bird on a Wire, evoked such strong feelings that it set me on a journey of slow making. The making of the art also transformed not only my inner life, but it created a friendship with the author and it is slowly restoring a relationship with my own father. Bird on a Wire, this short autoethnographic narrative, continues in my life and serves as a constant reminder that our stories can indeed be used by others. Evocative scholarship enables purifying conversations. It calls for incarnation and action. And finally, final negotiations, my latest collaboration with Carolyn Ellis, contemplating, envisioning and working collectively on a book cover was among the most rewarding experiences during my graduate school. It was a form of scholarship, a new form of learning, a different way to relating to my mentor. Working on the art, slowly progressing, was a gracious exchange. Witnessing Carolyn, her joy of learning and working on this collage is among my most treasured educational achievements. So what I have learned in the art studio and from my work as a maker is how creating, responding through materials leads to the acquisition of valuable knowledge, wisdom, experiences, transformations, epiphanies, but first and foremost to a more interdependent life. When I am in the studio, I have less desire of wanting more. When I am in the studio, I transform along with my materials and renew in my commitment to become an offering and to cultivate a deep reverence for life, all life. So to return where I started, I think the poet is right. 
consider yourself blessed. These stones that break your bones will build an altar of your love. Your home is the garden. Carry its odor hidden in you into the city. Suddenly your enemies will buy seed packets and fall to their knees to plant flowers in the dirt by the road. They call you friend and honor your passing among them. And when asked who is that, they will say, Oh, that one has been beloved by us since before time began. Give everything away, except your garden, your worry, your fear, your small-mindedness. Your garden can never be taken from you.